Ageing in Australia is a huge topic at the moment. We're talking, uh, you know, a critical issue within Australia and the world for that matter um, with regards to ageing. One of the things that we are focusing on is that sector, but not because we're focusing on the ageing person, it's because we're focusing on what their needs are or what they want and what they desire and what's missing in businesses to support that. So it is one of the areas that we work in um, because of its need and because they are missing the point of having those conversations, those initial conversations with people who are ageing. What makes us different to anybody else that's out there? What's making us different to any other consulting firm that's out there that we're playing in this space? What makes us different, Elle? Well, I think the whole thing is that we haven't put limitations on what people can receive or what they want. Then why, why can't people have it all? Everybody does deserve to be listened to, and the ageing population have very and any like any person have very strong feelings and views about what they do want. Not being told what they should have or what they could have, it's like what we've done is really made sure we're listening to what it is that is important to that person and how do we best support that with the services that we are delivering. Mm. I go as far as to say that as well that let's put the elephant in the room. To have a conversation, it'll go back to our previous conversations, what's been our challenges to get our business successful, get it out there, get it marketed, take it to market, get people to understand that we're doing something differently. One of the things is that we've acknowledged the concerns of all of our customers. So we have more than one customer. We have an end customer for the service provider or the business that we work with, but we also have a customer that is our business. So if I go out to a CEO, for example, and the CEO is sitting there telling me that I've got concerns about rising costs, fixed incomes, the economic environment within Australia, use of technology, not enough capital, all of those sorts of conversations, I have to acknowledge those as valid because to them they are a valid concern. So when I go and have a conversation, unless I've got an answer and a solution to solve those concerns, I won't get in the door. I've got to actually acknowledge those, have a, have a valid, simple solution that meets those needs, and then I've got to work on um, some way of getting them to the next level, that this is a different way of looking, thing, at, looking at things. What do you think our greatest challenges have been in that space, David? I think it's people that are in the industries have been in there for a long, long time. And to get in the positions of um, where they're at, they've had to have been in there a long time. And I think what that done has then done is narrowed the thought process. So if you've always been in one industry and you've always consistently been told the same thing, irrelevant of what it is, you now believe that that's the only way. Mm. So I think it's more around that trying to tell them that we need to break that mould and we need to think outside of that to gain the experience and knowledge from all industries and try and get the best for that industry that we can. And I think that's been the biggest challenge is people actually being able to go, what I've been taught and told for the last 15 years, there actually is something else. Mm. So I think that's the biggest challenge um, that I've noticed anyway. Mm. I think sometimes people get so focused on looking inwards and they forget to actually step backwards as well too to get that broader picture as you were saying. Mm. I think from, uh, you know, and this is, we talked about what each of us bring to the business. One of the things that my strengths are, and, and Ellen and David can you know, say yay or nay on this, but one of the strengths that I bring is I have an ability, and it's a bit of a weird ability sometimes, to be able to see things almost in a seventh dimension. So it's almost about, I can see how things join together. I can see how people um, consider that that's something they can't move on. And to get them to move to here, I have to use something that's so um, familiar to them that they can understand it. They feel safe and secure in understanding it. They feel safe in the knowledge that I can hang on to it as, a, as, a, as an anchor. And then I can show them that it can be delivered in a different way, step by step. So. One of, one of the strengths I have is that um, broad ability to have a whole range of experience in industries and a whole range of experiences in 
finance, in business, in education, in risk, in those sorts of areas. And one of the, the biggest challenges that I have found, and I had this conversation with David uh, over the last couple of days, is that when we first went to market, we thought the term um, mandatory compliance was going to be something that every CEO in every company or every business in Australia would understand. The word mandatory means you have to, compliance means you're meeting some sort of rule or legislation. That has been one of my most incredibly difficult challenges because I realised that people didn't understand a simple term like that. Why is that? Why do you think that happened? What did I miss in my, my original thought process that I missed in that? Well, you miss the simplicity of it. You say what it means. Mm. Yeah, which means, so mandatory compliance? Means that everybody has to be trained in every, you know, every person in that business has to be trained. That's yeah. it. It's as simple as that. That's right, yeah. So it's, that's the level of simplicity that we bring and I think we're able to sit in a conversation with, uh, or a discussion or a meeting um, with people within business, whether it be government, whether it be you know, ministerial, whether it be Senate level, whether it be sector-wide level, whether it be peak body level, whether it be an SME, and have the exact same conversation at a level of simplicity that they get it. If you say it's mandatory compliance, it means you have to do it, everybody has to do it. You don't get a choice, here's the rules, you need to meet it, have that conversation. But I don't think people do have that conversation. What do you think, Elle? I mean, in the, in the spaces we play, why has that been such a... Um, a difficult thing for industry to overcome? I think a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And um, particularly around work health and safety, is that ignorance is no excuse. However, so many organisations have been, whether it's been intentional or quite often unintentional, that they're not fully aware of what, they, what their requirements are. And, and I think that's been part of that challenge. Until an incident happens, then they start going, oh, should have I done this or shouldn't have I? These are the challenges that I believe we have faced. Mm -hmm. And when you have something that is that mandatory compliance, that people go, I think it's too complex, I don't know how to do it, it makes them very vulnerable. Why, what's your passion? Why, Why? do what we're doing? I think for me, I think it's around, um, I just really enjoy the training of people or educating people that then that is valued outside the place that they're working at. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's transferable uh, and being able to explain to people in just really basic, easy terms, the stuff that they believe that they could never get. Mm -hmm. Elle, what's your passion? My passion is making sure that the day finishes better than it started. Yeah. And, and I think that's um, so imperative when we're spending so much time in work environment that being part of an organisation which is so closely aligned to my values and my ethics and beliefs, is, that's an absolute passion to make sure that people, as you so said so often, are going home feeling better than when they arrived. Mm. My passion is pretty simple. Um, I think that... From my perspective, I've experienced life in a family that's been destroyed by poor work, work health and safety and by poor culture in business. Um, so I think that's an important thing. Work health and safety in this country drives a lot, of, a lot of improvements within business. But I think it's about more than that. I think it's about having a good culture in a workforce. It's about not being transactionalised. People shouldn't be transactionalised. I think it's respecting their capability and their abilities respecting where they want to be in a business, respecting um, regardless of what their profession is. Uh, I think it's also um, most definitely about always seeking excellence, um, at the, to be the best at what we can do. It doesn't mean to say we have to be the best, it's about seeking to be or do the best of what we do. Um, so I think that's important. But why I suppose is it important for our success as a business to stay true to that. What, what, why is that so important for us to stay true to those values? What happens if we don't? You won't, it's the, the whole thing comes back to is that it's our customer. Who is our customer? And if we're not being true to who ourselves, who, how can we actually be delivering 
what the customer wants.